I love it. I love it. Wow. <laughs> I love it. Look at this. This is, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Hey, I'm not surprised. <laughs> hey, what's popping, my homies? Hope you're doing well, feeling blessed, having a good day, having a good week. This main event is, what is this main event? Manofia Rowe taking on Erin Blanchfield, aka Erin the Mugger Madoff. Guys, before we get into making predictions, breaking down the fights, we look at my bets from last week. I dusted the bookie, pure money, that's money. Now Peyton Talbot, minus 140. In reality, more like minus 600. Andre Lima, minus 150. Dusting up Severino, Severino. He got made to be uh, Luis Suarez. You know, why are you biting him? Get out of the UFC. Off you go, you dosser. Julian Arosa, plus 160. I said it word for word in my breakdown. Ramos, you know, gets tired. Julian Arosa might wrap him up. He wrapped him up. Let's go, plus 160. That's money. And I also had a parlay on Zelesniakova and Padilla not to go over distance. And that parlay was plus money and it absolutely smacked. Now guys, if you're somebody that wants my bets for this UFC card, you're not going to find them on this video. This video is about making predictions, not bets. If you want my bets, who I'm personally betting, the only way to do that is to get yourself a Money City membership. And by the way, the Money City membership, it works out at $2.50 per card. So when I'm talking about cheap, you know, that's an understatement. It's massively cheap. And it's funny because, you know, you've got people like Skinny Bets and I don't want to keep name dropping, but... You've got some people charging crazy prices and they couldn't even tell you what a 50-50 fight is. These people don't know what they're talking about. You know, it's kind of funny to me, but yeah, extremely cheap. If you want my bets, go over to my Patreon, the Money City membership, and also join my Discord. Now taking a look at the Money City champions, and I just mentioned that there's people charging crazy prices and they don't know what they're talking about. Let me tell you someone that knows what they're talking about. See my guy, Sean. See my guy, Sean over here. Every week he's popping in the comments. Every single week he's handing you free winners. Let's go, Sean. Let's go. And shout out to... There was one other Money C winner. I forgot the username, but... Yeah, guys. Let's go. Let's go. Moving into the first matchup of the card, we've got Angel Pacheco taking on Kalen Lochran. Now, guys, in my opinion, it's an easy prediction to make. If you look at Angel Pacheco on the contender, dude was getting teed off on. You know, Danny Silver landing boxing combination after boxing combination, just dusting up Angel Pacheco. Whereas if you look at Kalen Lochran, he did lose his UFC debut. But if you look at Lochran, he's a prospect. You know, the dude's not bad. So guys, in my opinion, there is a bit of a difference in levels when it comes to Lochran and Pacheco. Pacheco's tough, but toughness doesn't win you the fight. It keeps you in the fight. Whereas Lochran, I believe, is smarter offensively and defensively. And he can also get takedowns in between these striking exchanges. So yeah, in my opinion, the prediction would have to be Kane and Lochran. Obviously, there's a big difference between fighting Taylor Lapalus in your UFC debut and then fighting someone who's defensively really, really bad in Angel Pacheco. So yeah, the pick is Kane and Lochran. Moving into a matchup between Andre Petrosky taking on Jacob Malkoon. Now guys, both these guys are grapplers, right? Petrosky's a black belt in Brazil. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He's also a wrestler. So the grappling of Petrovsky is very good. Now, if you look at Jacob Malkoon, he's more of a wrestler, right? His grappling, the Jiu-Jitsu isn't on the same level as Petrovsky, but they're both still good grapplers. They're both still good wrestlers. Now, guys, more than likely, you would expect to see this matchup go to the fence. You would expect to see this matchup go to the map. And I know every now and then you get the grappler versus grappler and it plays out on the feet. But for the most part, you would expect to see some grappling between two grapplers. Now, something that's quite interesting, if you look at Petrosky, his cardio is kind of dusty. And that could potentially be a problem against someone like Jacob Malkoon because Jacob Malkoon can wrestle round in, round out. But it's interesting because if the matchup does go to the mat, Petrosky's the better grappler, better jiu-jitsu player. It's an interesting matchup, grappler versus grappler. They're both coming off losses. Andre Petrosky got absolutely dusted by Michelle Pereira. And if you look at Jacob Malkoon, he would have beat Cody Brundage because Cody Brundage is like one of the worst UFC fighters of all time. But for some reason, Jacob Malkoon, he got himself disqualified. Don't know why he'd done that. Because obviously when you lose to Cody Brundage, that doesn't look good. You know what I'm saying? You look at your resume, you see a loss to Cody Brundage. That's dusty. But yeah, guys, decent matchmaking by the UFC. In my opinion, I'm going to side with Jacob Malcolm because I believe the cardio, you know, the fact that he can wrestle round in, round out, 
and Petrovsky kind of fatigues. That's the reason why I'm going to side with the wrestler, Jacob Malkoon, to beat Petrovsky. Moving into a matchup between Melissa Gatto taking on Victoria Dudakova. And guys, Melissa Gatto, she's all about Muay Thai. Her teep kick is really good. You know, she'll dig that teep kick right to the midsection. Now, I have cashed a bet on Melissa Gatto before when she fought uh, Sajara Eubanks a few years ago. She was losing most of that fight, but then she kicked her in the body in the final round. And Sajara Eubanks just, you know, she crumbled dusted now looking at melissa gatto most recently she lost to lipsky and the main reason as to why she lost that fight lipsky's boxing it was just on a higher level you know it was cleaner it was better so that's the thing with melissa gatto i'd say she's more of a kicker than a boxer you know better with the kicks now on the flip side you've got victoria dudakova who is primarily a wrestler however if you look at her performance against Jin Yu frey her boxing looked good it looked fast it looked improved and i'd say also the right kick of victoria dudakova you know it was finding the mark but yeah this matchup specifically it's not an easy prediction to make guys in my opinion in the first seven and a half minutes the first half of the matchup Melissa Gatto should do her best work. You know, the team kick's good. The power is more than Dudakova. But then I've got a feeling that Melissa Gatto is going to start to slow down, start to fatigue, start to get tired. And that's where I believe the boxing speed of Dudakova could start to really show. And I also think she could get the fight to the mat. So yeah, in a matchup that's pretty difficult to pick, Give me the underdog. Give me Dudakova. Now, moving into a matchup between Ebo Aslan taking on Anton Turkali. Now, this is a rematch. So, if you're somebody that wants to bet on the winner from the first fight, in that case, you're going to bet on Turkali. But in my opinion, Turkali's not that good. And I know I've said that a couple times, right? Most recently, I said that for Jarno Ahrens. And Jarno Ahrens put on an absolute masterclass. He completely dusted Stephen Wynn. And guys, I don't mind admitting I'm wrong when I'm wrong. I didn't know that John Aarons went into monk mode, but he did. And the performance, it was super clean. So respect to that. But looking at Anton Turkali, the reason why I say he's not that good, if you look at his striking defense, he leaves his chin in the air and he also doesn't really react to the punches coming his way. So the chin's in the air and as the punches are being thrown, he'll just kind of stand there and eat those punches. And he also crashes into the opponent. So there's a few things I don't really like about Anton Turkali, but he has won the matchup. He's already beaten Ebo Aslan. But yeah, in the first matchup, guys, Ebo Aslan does do okay in the first round, but then he gets super tired. His cardio is dusty, pure dust. And that's because he's got a bit of muscle. And obviously, when you've got the muscle, it kind of slows you down in a matchup, in a fight. So, guys, if the matchup plays out the same way it did play out before, Ebo Aslan's going to do well, and then he's going to get tired, and then Anton Turkai is going to wrap him up like a blunt. Guys, for me personally, I'm going to side with Ebo Aslan to get the win in the rematch. I'm just not really a fan of Turkali, but if I get the prediction wrong, I don't really care because I'm not going to bet this matchup. You know, this is a prediction. It's not a bet. And to be honest, the fights that I don't bet on, I don't really care if I get them right or wrong. So yeah, give me Ibo Aslan to win the rematch, but it's a risky one. You know, if he gets tired, he might get wrapped up like a blunt. Moving into a matchup between Conor Matthews taking on Dennis Bazooka. And this is essentially a contender series matchup. You know, 7-1 versus 11-4. Now, Dennis Bazooka got bazookaed by what's his name jamal emmers dusted by jamal emmers and i took jamal emmers in that fight but i didn't expect jamal emmers to just land one punch and the fight's done so that's kind of disappointing to see dennis bazooka get bazookaed like that now guys connor matthews i bet against him on the contender and he kind of dusted my bet and i'd have to say that in that performance he just done everything right you know got takedowns when he needed takedowns the cardio looked good the striking was good Conor Matthews performed on the contender and there's a pretty good chance that Conor Matthews goes into this matchup goes into this UFC debut and also performs against Dennis Bazooka seeing as Dennis Bazooka isn't really performing well so far but then again bazookas for woodson and jamal emmers which isn't the same level as Conor matthews so this matchup is kind of low level it's a contender series matchup i'm gonna side with dennis bazooka dennis bazooka trains at a pretty good camp in long and weidman mma so he's got good training partners good coaches and guys i don't actually think bazooka striking is that bad i think it's okay but he's not been able to show that because Sean Woodson was too good. Jamal Emmers was too good. Whereas Conor Matthews is more on the same level as Dennis Bazooka. But give me Dennis Bazooka to essentially bazooka the opponent. Moving into a matchup between Julio Arce taking on Herbert Burns. Now guys, here's the thing. Herbert Burns is a really, really, really good jiu-jitsu player. His jiu-jitsu is extremely good, right? So if he gets Julio Arce to the mat, more than likely, he will wrap him up like a blunt, right? But here's the thing. Herbert Burns, the cardio, dust, 
pure dust and you don't want that you know when you're betting on these fighters you don't want to bet on people that's got dusty cardio and that is Herbert Burns and he's also been away for over a year and a half and his striking is not that great he did completely dust Naver Train you know a big knee in the clinch he's all about Muay Thai when it's on the feet but yeah, primarily a jiu-jitsu player with dusty cardio. Now guys, Julio Arce on the flip side, he's not bad. You know, the striking's good, technically sharp with the boxing. And he's fought some good competition. You know, been in the UFC for a while, had some tough fights. He's been dusted in a couple matchups like against Song, but Song is very good. We know that. Now guys, in my opinion, let's not overthink this one. You know, Herbert Burns been away for over a year and a half. Dusty cardio bad striking if he doesn't get around one stoppage more than likely he gets dusted now there is a chance we're wrong right there is a chance that if it goes to the mat the big underdog cashes but logically speaking Julio Arce should win the matchup so that's my pick moving into a matchup between Werner Jandadoba taking on Lupi Cadenas now guys Werner Jandadoba aka Deuce Bigelow Raul Rosas Jr's big sister she's very good on the mat super good on the mat her jujitsu is very good and that's exactly what verna does to win matchups you know she gets you to the mat establishes dominant positions on the mat and essentially beats you with her grappling that's what she does she will walk forward and show toughness on the feet but overall she's a jujitsu player a high level jujitsu player so she's going to want to take loopy to the mat take her back take an arm take a neck she's going to want to grapple with loopy Godinez. but the problem is loopy is in good form you know she's improving fight to fight she's looking very good what's she done to elise reed elise reed get dusted then she had a really good fight with baby shark which you know baby shark's one of our favorite you know tabitha ricci very close fight but tabitha ricci's a prospect and so is lupi cadena so yeah that fight was always going to be close now guys in my opinion if the matchup stays on the feet lupi cadena should really box with verna jandadoba if the matchup goes to the mat then obviously there is a chance that verna submits lupi cadena but guys don't forget Lupi's wrestling's not bad. She does scramble really well. So there's also a chance that even if Verna gets Lupi to the mat, she's going to make life difficult for Verna. You know, it's not going to be easy to really establish dominant positions on the mat. And that's going to be because Lupi Cadenas, her wrestling's good. Her scrambling's good. So give me Lupi Cadenas to actually keep this match up on the feet or to essentially escape dominant positions on the mat and to essentially outclass Verna Jandidoba. I think Lupi's form is good you know so give me loopy to win the matchup moving into a matchup between nate vitrain taking on jamal emmers now guys let's start with the obvious if you don't like nate vitrain explain why explain why because you do have to explain why everybody should like nate vitrain you know this guy sounds like he's drunk all the time and i know i sound like i'm high all the time but nate vitrain's a g this guy's a g right his personality is cool but also his fighting style you know, he's going to walk forward and just throw bomb after bomb after bomb. And I know technically he's not the best defensively, but that's what he's about. You know, he wants to get hit. He wants you to land your best punches. He wants you to essentially win round one. You know, take round one. You can have round one. I'm going to land a big shot eventually, and you're not going to like it. That's what he's all about. And I appreciate that, right? He's not championship caliber. But guys, here's the thing. There's a lot of fighters that ain't championship quality. You can still appreciate what they're doing. You know, I still appreciate Nate Vitrain. Now, here's the thing. The opponent, Jamal Emmers, he is technically better than Nate Vitrain. His grappling's very good. His jujitsu's very good. He moves his feet. He's essentially smarter than Nate Vitrain. You know, fighting more from a chess-like perspective. You know, plays the chess match. But some people may say, you know what? Forget all that. Give me Nate Vitrain because Nate Vitrain's going to cause damage. Give me Nate Vitrain because Nate Vitrain's going to walk forward. Give me Nate Vitrain because... Why not? People are going to side with, with that perspective. Now, in my opinion, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take Jamal Emmers to essentially get Nate Vitrain to the mat, use some wrestling, use some jiu-jitsu. And he would be wise to do that because if he doesn't do that, essentially you're giving Nate a dogfight. You're giving him that striking matchup. So give me Jamal Emmers to get the fight to the mat and to essentially make the matchup a little bit boring. Now, guys, moving into a matchup between Chidi and Jaquani taking on Reese McKee. Now, guys, here's the thing. Reese McKee. This guy's striking defense, abysmal. It's almost like he's cousins with Darren Elkins. You know, blind man's defense, his striking defense, it's just bad. You know, this guy's got brain damage and more than likely his career's not going to be long because if you take punch after punch after punch and you can't get away at the punches, your striking defense is bad. You're going to lose fights. You're going to lose brain cells. And that's what's happening to Reese McKee. 
But he is tough, right? That guy's tough. And even if you crack him with your best shot, he's going to remain in the fight. And that's a good thing against Chidi and Jokwani because Chidi, his cardio is not great. His kicks though, his kicks are really good. The head kick, the body kick, the low kick. Chidi's a really good kicker. Guys, recently I bet against Michael Wallach-Zaychuk, right? I took Michelle Pereira TKO or decision. He won that fight by submission, so I didn't cash the bet. But recently I did bet against Michael Wallach-Zaychuk. And the reason as to why I've done that, if you look at Chidi and Jaquani against Wallach-Zaychuk, he was dusting him up with the kicks. So in my opinion, if you put him against someone that's defensively bad like Reese McKee, more than likely Chidi and Jaquani is going to land multiple kicks, just like he did against Michael Wallach-Zaychuk. But here's the thing, like I mentioned, the cardio of Chidi and Jaquani is not great. So Reese McKee is a punch bag and he stays in the fight so would it be a, a bad idea to put a, an in-play bet on Reese McKee after he gets dusted up early in round one potentially not but personally guys my prediction will be Chidi and Jokwani if his cardio holds up he should really exploit the bad defense of Reese McKee as multiple fighters have already done so so give me Chidi and Jokwani now moving into a matchup between Bill Algio taking on Kyle Nelson now guys in my opinion Bill Algio is like the off-brand Corey Sandhagen in my opinion that's a good description of Bill Algio you know, on the feet, his kickboxing's good. You know, kind of switches stances, puts the head kick up there, the body kick. His jiu-jitsu's good. Senior perfecto, you know, Bill Algio, he's okay. And on the flip side, you've got Kyle Nelson. This guy does the same thing. You know, every single fight, it's the same thing. Big power from the opening seconds. 100% power. And some people might say, you know, that's a good thing. You know, the fighters that I'm betting on, I want them to throw the kitchen sink. I want them to try find big knockouts. But the thing is, you get tired. If you don't find a knockout, you get tired. You become a sitting duck. You become even more predictable than what you already are. So that's going to be the downside to Kyle Nelson. There's not really much evolution in the game of Kyle Nelson. Now, he has been winning. His form's been okay. But like I said, there's no evolution. There's no improvements. We know what we're going to get from a guy like Kyle Nelson. And it's a one-dimensional game. You know, throw the kitchen sink. Try find a big knockout. If it doesn't happen... The cardio starts to turn to dust. The output diminishes. And against someone like Bill Algio, who has good cardio, good jujitsu, good output. In my opinion, Senor Perfecto, easy pick. And I've got to stop saying in my opinion because I'm the only one speaking. I'm the only one speaking. This is my opinion. Everyone knows that. Why do I keep saying in my opinion? I've got to stop that. Now moving into a matchup between the Sultan Razi Boev taking on Cedricus Dumas. Now guys... I cashed Ruzzy Boev as a plus 200 underdog in his UFC debut against Bruno Ferreira. Now, am I going to bet him against Cedric Dumas as a massive favourite? Absolutely not. Because there's no reason to do so, right? Nobody believed in Ruzzy Boev in his UFC debut. His stock was low. He was a plus 200 underdog. Goes in there, dusts the opponent. And now his stock has just risen right? It's almost like Bitcoin. Bitcoin's going crazy right now. So I kind of want to compare Rossi Boev and his UFC debut to Bitcoin now. You don't want to buy Bitcoin when the price is high. You don't want to do that. You want to buy Bitcoin when the price is low. And the same with Rossi Boev. In his UFC debut, the stock was low, plus 200. I cashed that. So do I want to bet Rossi Boev this time round, considering he's minus 300, considering the bookie expects him to win, considering, you know, it's a, a bigger risk, a bigger price. In my opinion, Nearly said it again. Nearly said it again. I'm not going to do it, guys. I'm not going to bet Razi Baev at this price. Also, if you look at Razi Baev, he's dusting all of his opponents round one. I don't think he's left round one in like half a decade, which is kind of a red flag, but also a green flag because, you know, if you go in there and get it done in round one, that's better than going to round two. But eventually you are going to go to round two and, you know, he hasn't been there in a while. So that's even more reason not to take Razi Boev at minus 300 or whatever it is. Now, guys, on the flip side, Dumas, his takedown defense isn't good. His striking defense, kind of dusty. The cardio is a little bit dusty. He'll kind of get gun shy at times, especially after he gets cracked. He's really not on the same level in terms of hype as Razi Boev. But you know what? Give me the big underdog. Give me Cedric Dumas to, to pull it off. Now, moving into a matchup between Chris Weidman taking on Bruno Silva. Now, guys, here's the thing. At times, I can be strongly opinionated on matchups. And when you're wrong after being strongly opinionated on a matchup, you always get that one moth that goes to the comments and they're like, you was disrespectful, meh, 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 right? You're always going to get that one moth. But here's the thing. 
Nobody dictates to me how I break down matchups. I'm always going to be strongly opinionated on specific matchups when I feel it's necessary to do so. And I believe it's necessary to be strongly opinionated with this matchup. In my opinion, Chris Weidman should not be fighting. He should not be near a cage. He should not be going to the cage this weekend. Even if he wins, you know, it doesn't change anything. I still believe that. I still believe that Chris Weidman should retire. He's basically 40 years old, but in fight miles, he's older than 40. He recently, well, not recently, but he did snap his leg against Uriah Hall. Now, if that wasn't like the clearest and obvious sign from God that you should retire, then I don't know what is. But he didn't retire. He actually recovered and came back. Now, some people might say, well, that's an accomplishment in itself. And I would agree. I would agree with that. But it's an accomplishment that doesn't really need to be accomplished. You're a former champion that is massively past her prime and in all honesty, it's pretty clear that Chris Weidman is just fighting for a paycheck. Now guys, on the flip side, you've got Bruno Silva who has lost four of his last five, but he's been in there with Alex Pereira. He's been in there with Shara Magomedov, Brendan Allen, GM3, Brad Tavares, and he dusted Brad Tavares and Brad Tavares outworked Chris Weidman. Guys, in my opinion, even if Chris Weidman is one nil up, two nil up, Bruno Silva is going to dust him. He's going to send his chin to the King of Shadow City, Ben Askren. Bruno Silva is going to KO Chris Weidman. And if Chris Weidman wins, like I said, it doesn't change anything. He shouldn't be fighting. And if anything, Bruno Silva, you should be cut. If you lose to Chris Weidman, you should be cut. Now, guys, moving into the co-main event, we've got Vicente Luque taking on Joaquin Buckley. Now, guys, there's really no excuse for missing this co-main event. If you miss this co-main event... It best be because your wife's giving birth or you're getting married or something like that. But even then, you should have your phone out, right? You should be watching it still. Uh, you don't miss this co main event. Vicente Luque, Joaquin Buckley. There's so much violence. So much violence to be had. There's blood to be donated to the canvas. Vicente Luque and Joaquin Buckley. You don't miss this. Now, Vicente Luque does have more experience. Vicente Luque has better jiu-jitsu. And Vicente Luque can crack. You know, he's not going to run away from the fight. He's going to stand and trade. He's taken a lot of damage throughout his UFC career. But as you saw against RDA, he's still good to go. Now, RDA is washed. And he doesn't really have the same power like Buckley. So it's going to be a different matchup for Vicente Luque compared to what he just had. But guys, Vicente Luque has fought many big hitters. You know, that's what he's done. He's traded with big hitters. He is a big hitter. Vicente Luque, you know, he enjoys the chaos. He enjoys the fire. He enjoys it so much that he got brain bleed. So that's how much damage Luque's taken throughout his UFC career. Now, guys, Numansa, Joaquin Buckley. This guy can crack. We know that. He's got one of the best knockouts in UFC history against Impa Kasunganai. And that's a knockout you can replay over and over and over. It just doesn't get old. That spinning back kick was just insane. It sent Impa deep into the land of Shadow City. Deep into the land to meet Ben Askren. Now guys, this co-main event, Vicente Luque could get a stoppage, a KO stoppage, or even submit Joaquin Buckley. Or on the flip side, Buckley could find a big knockout. We know he can do it. He's proven he can do it. Now guys, the co-main event, the moral of the story, you don't miss it, right? Give me Vicente Luque. Give me the experience. Give me the better jiu-jitsu player. I think as the fight progresses, Buckley's going to fatigue. He's going to get tired. And Vicente Luque's been there right so give me Vicente Luque and I think he's going to become a slight underdog give me Vicente Luque now moving into the main event we've got Aaron Namagamadov or Aaron Blanchfield taking on Mino Fioro and guys in my opinion it's a pretty easy breakdown to make I didn't say it's an easy pick to make I said it's an easy breakdown and what I mean by that is the fight is won based on where the fight takes place if we stay on the feet Clearly, Mano Fioro is a Muay Thai beast, and she's going to dust up Erin Namogamadov. If we go to the mat, that's where you're going to see Erin display Namogamadov skills. I know her name's Erin Blanchfield, but guys, in my Discord, I've always called this girl Erin Namogamadov, and that's because she's been putting money in our pockets, right? This girl was an absolute beast when it comes to wrestling, when it comes to jiu-jitsu. Her ground skill is extremely good. Now, guys, the only time I picked against Erin Magomedov was in her UFC debut when she fought Miranda Maverick. And Miranda Maverick's a very good grappler, a very good wrestler. So when I see Miranda go back to her corner, telling her corner, look, I can't stop a takedown. I can't get back to my feet. When I see that and when I hear that, that's the moment I realize this girl's different. This girl is literally a beast. If she's making Miranda, you know, basically say to her corner, I quit. 
this girl's out grappling me. This girl's beating me. I don't know what to do. That's the moment I learned. You know, this girl's something. This girl's the real deal. Let's not bet against Erin Magomedov. Let's stop betting on her. And she was even a, a slight underdog against Jessica Andrade. And Jessica Andrade, you know, she's getting taken down by Laura Murphy. So that was uh, an easy bet to make. Now, guys, here's the thing. The stand-up, the striking of Erin Magomedov, Erin Blanchfield, it's really not good. Like, it's really not good. So, guys, if this matchup stays on the feet, Manofia Rowe's going to dust up Erin Blanchfield. She's going to land knees in the clinch, elbows, big kicks. She's really going to teach Erin Nurmagomedov a serious lesson. So, that's why I'm telling you that the fight is won based on where it takes place. If we go to the mat, we know what to expect. If it stays on the feet, we know what to expect. Guys, I've never picked against Manofia Rowe. I think she's an absolute beast. I've only picked against Erin Blanchfield once. Both these girls have made me a lot of money right? It's a really, really good main event. But the reason why I'm going to side with Erin Namogamadov, she's 10 years younger than Mano Fiero. And this is a 25-minute fight. So Mano might dust her up in round one. But if Mano gets tired, which I think she may, because I've seen it, I've seen her kind of fatigue. And guys, Erin Blanchfield, once she establishes that crucifix position on the mat, especially when you're tired, it's game over. So give me Erin Blanchfield to get a late stoppage, round three, round four, round five. Probably not round five. Somewhere in the middle of the main event, I believe Erin Blanchfield, she should get a stoppage. So that's my pick. Give me Erin the Mugger made of. As always, guys, let me know you're taking in the main event, the co-main event, your straight bets, your doubles, your parlays, your Money City bets. All that good stuff, drop in the comment section below. And as always, keep your eyes to the sky and never glue to your shoes. Peace.